Cinema Caliente gets up close and personal with filmmakers on the art of filmmaking in New Mexico and is broadcast on community television and internet. Cinema Caliente would like to thank the following sponsors. Production Outfitters. Field and Frame. And the city of Albuquerque. With our sunny skies, diverse culture, and creative people, New Mexico is a great place to live and work. Today on Cinema Caliente, we'll be talking to a very talented filmmaker about her inspirations and passions. Our guest today is Elizabeth Galen Baker, a very talented filmmaker, writer, and founder of Spirit Productions. Her work suggests a global viewpoint with a genuine care of people and animals and a strong current of spirituality. Elizabeth, we're so honored to have you on our show. Welcome to Cinema Caliente. That's the loveliest introduction I've ever had. Thank you. <laughs> Elizabeth, you're a writer, producer, editor, but you've also been a production assistant, AD, UPM, script supervisor. What do you think the hardest job on a set is? Making a movie. <laughs> That's the hardest, and, and it takes everybody. It takes every single person. And if you can inspire people to work together as a community mm -hmm. instead of to compete with each other, no matter if it's their job is big or small, then you've got a great movie. Mm -hmm. Unless, of course, you have a bad script. <laughs> Tell us about the first job you ever had on a movie set. It took me three years to get hired as a PA on Nerds of a Feather, a low-budget independent film in uh, LA. And I laugh because I say I can't remember if I was getting paid $50 a day or $50 a week for my 18-hour days. But within two weeks, I had become assistant to the director. I really, uh, I was on fire. I, I had a passion for what I was doing, and he let me assist him. And then on the next, film he made me UPM which was wow. amazing and um, I think that it was m making 11 low budget independent films that allowed me to play almost every uh, you know take care of every situation if an actress didn't show up in the middle of the night I was the woman cop or the <laughs> lesbian truck driver and that's how I learned Elizabeth, now that you're making your own movies, writing, directing, producing, how important do you think it was for you to have gone through all those other jobs on the set on all those movies? How has that informed your work? I, I think it was the most important thing. And I've even started a program, a nonprofit called Film Apprenticeship Programs, so that everybody that wants to make movies, passionate to make movies, that's the first requirement, uh, has an opportunity to play all those different roles because if you know what everybody else is doing, uh, you're able to build it into that community that makes it work better. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the most important thing that ever happened to me. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit more on what those uh, 11 independent films, what you learned from that? Well, I was down in the trenches. You know, I was, some days, uh, once I was a script supervisor and we were on the set for 26 hours, obviously non-union right. shoots <laughs> and uh, and I I learned how to put a film together mm -hmm. and when I finally walked away and I walked away because my joke is and you know bless their hearts they were probably the 11 of the worst feature films ever made <laughs> but the truth for me is that in learning in that way uh, it really made it possible for me to write my first mm -hmm. documentary film and and I left making little films like that. They had a million and a half budget. I mean, not mm -hmm. very big. And I learned how to uh, put a film together and I walked away to see if I could write better films. That led me through a whole career of writing about film mm -hmm. and interviewing actors and interviewing directors and doing all of that and then when I made my first documentary, I was able to, I, I thought I better hire myself, no one else is going to <laughs> right. hire me. So I hired myself as the director and the writer and, uh, and made my first doc. 
I wanted to ask you about that. I, I believe writing is one of the most important things in the filmmaking project. And I think I tend to see younger filmmakers kind of um, not spending maybe as much time on the writing part, they, you know, the production, the technical part. They've all got down. Everybody can shoot a movie. But where do you place writing in, in that uh, in, in level of importance in filmmaking? Well, you know, I can't speak for anyone else. But for me, story is everything. And it doesn't matter to me whether I'm making a three to five minute we make your business the star type of, of presentation for a small business or whether I'm making a feature film. It's all the same. The story is everything. Speaking of your first film, When Buffaloes Roam, um, you're very interested in animal welfare. That film won 1999 Best Social Documentary for the New York Independent International Film Festival. Tell us about that. Well, I didn't know anything about Buffalo, in, at least in this lifetime, before I got an early morning phone call from a Lakota tribe member. And I was told that it was my responsibility to uh, save that herd. And so I ended up starting a document. They were very persuasive. <laughs> And uh, the next day, I, I, first of all, I raised $1,500 that very day to start wow. the Buffalo Field Campaign, which has very much protected that herd since 1998. And then I started my first documentary film. And mm -hmm. about four or five months later, a woman came along and actually gave me some seed money. I hired a camera crew and went to Yellowstone and I didn't have very much money to make it on, and I made a 10 minute, I had 40 hours of film, but I cut it down to 10 minutes. Peter Coyote heard what I was doing, and generous, wonderful actor that he is, offered to be the narrator. Mm -hmm. And when I finished it, I thought, well, find out if it's any good, send it to a film festival, and I thought, don't send it to Podunk, send it to New York. If it wins in New York, it means something. So that's what I did. The 10-minute piece activated Indian tribes, activated reports on it. There's a wonderful report last year in Harper, uh, and, and the, the uh, good things that happen is that uh, Udall now has it in Washington and they are trying to pass uh, regulations to protect the buffalo. The men, the cowboys, the, the Department of Livestock are all very arrogant mm. about, oh, they're only buffalo, see? And, and so I went in and I created a piece that showed that overview, not they're right, they're wrong, but my goodness, look at this terrible dynamic between humans and animals. And I think that's why it won, because it, 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 it took a broader view of the problem. So I think we need to do a lot of outreach, and those children need to understand, you know, what the earth and nature is all about, because we're all, I mean, it's all a circle. If these buffalo go, a lot of other things are going to go. We appear to be a nation of spectators who like to look, not join nature's rich plan. We like to look, but will we see in time? It's a big problem, very powerful. Um, Elizabeth, you've won Best Woman Director, Sony Classics New York, and the International uh, White Sands Film Festival for Trail of Painted Ponies. Yeah. Tell us about that. I had a burning desire to make that from the moment I saw the first horse. Uh, I don't know exactly what it is between me and horses, but and wonderful artists were painting full-size pieces, and I finally got permission to make that documentary. And Allie McGraw, the beautiful Allie McGraw, was uh, was painting one of the horses and I interviewed her and she said uh, let me help you if I can call me if you need me and I did about two weeks later and asked her if she would narrate the piece oh, nice. she instantly said yes I'd love for you to show the very uh, end where we were shooting um, and she's standing by a Kuan Yin and she looks very beautiful 
and she says the very first thing that I wrote once I got to Santa Fe, and it's the future of our country and the fate of the world depends on the vision of the artist. And, um, and, and somehow that statement shaped the whole piece. When I started to paint my horse and thought of it as decoration, and I've had time and months and months to think about what maybe secret voices were talking to me and what maybe I wanted to say with my horse, which is that if man and horse, or man and dog, or man and whatever, could respectfully honor the other creatures, be they other colored two-legged creatures, other cultured two-legged creatures, other four-legged creatures, if we could respect each other and honor each other's needs to have space to move in, clean air to breathe, and clean water to drink, and enough plain food to eat, we could all live happily ever after. Art is like that. It can crack open our hearts, regenerate our communities, and change our world. Since art is the true measure of time, perhaps it's time for us to realize that the fate of our country and the future of the entire world depends upon the vision of the artist. And we are all artists. I wanted to ask you about the Dreamcatcher project, uh, a piece that sort of developed around the 9-11 tragedy. And uh, tell us how that, how that got started. Actually, it was not even a film. It should have been a film, but it wasn't. I was press secretary for Lieutenant Governor Walter Bradley when 9-11 happened. And we decided that it would really be wonderful if we could make Dreamcatchers for the firemen and the children of New York. So I wrote a little script took Walter into Channel 13, and I made a PSA that no. said, we know you're all scared, but go into your senior citizen centers, go into your scout centers, go into your high schools, and let's make some dream catchers for New York. That was an 18 hour a day type of project. It was just amazing. and. Uh, all of these ideas just started coming to me. I, I have no idea where creation really, you know, is able to come from in that way. But we decided to invite five medicine people from the tribes. Walter, who's a Republican and a Southern Baptist, gave prizes to the people who made the most dream catchers took a delegation of 26 people, got met by the New York Fire Department, went to the mayor's office, and then finally actually had the honor of going up on the platform that had been built at uh, Ground Zero. And we were allowed to do 45 minutes of ceremony, singing uh, songs and blessing the land and trying to help what we called the the ghosts of uh, that were still caught in the wreckage to find their way out and find their way home. It was an amazing experience for everybody. And we, the state of New Mexico, and most people don't know this, made 10,000 dream catchers. And Governor Gary Johnson let us bless them in the rotunda of the roundhouse before we took off for New York. And we were there about three weeks after 911 happened. Speaking of uh, Governor Gary Johnson, in 2002, you helped spark the film industry here in New Mexico. I did. I went, yeah, you know, I was working for, in the lieutenant governor's office, and I simply went and talked to uh, Governor Johnson, and I said, um, we can have a real film industry here. And he said, well, uh, don't look now, but we have a film industry. And I said, in all due respect, sir, we haven't had a film made here in 10 years. So he said, well, what do you want me to do? And I said, I want you to watch my back. I want to go to all these little groups, and I want to invite them around your table to really talk about how we can pass this legislation. And I gave him the list of who I thought should be there, and he said, if you can get all of those people around my table, I'll come. 
And so wow. uh, somehow or another, I managed to do it. And then through a, a real blessing, I walked in with uh, Shirley MacLaine and Val Kilmer, and it changed the consciousness in the room, and it changed the course of New Mexico forever. You must have had to do a little bit more of a hard sell on Governor Johnson than just bring these people together. I mean, he was not some, as we know, he wasn't normally somebody that was big into government spending. And, and although this technically wasn't spending, it was a tax rebate, it was still something I'm sure that politically maybe he had to think through a little bit. Well, he didn't because what you don't know about Gary Johnson is he's a teenager about movies. He loves movies and uh, he didn't have to think twice. First of all, he didn't think I could do it. He said, if you, you know, the, the deal is if you get every one of those people on your list around the table, I'll come. Uh, and that was uh, because he didn't think I'd ever be able to get all, those guys don't talk to one another, you know? And, uh, but also he loves movies. And when I let him know that Shirley was coming and that Val was coming, and then I, planned a whole campaign where I got Shirley and Marsha Mason and Allie McGraw and Val Kilmer all went before the legislatures and I could never have done it. No one would have listened to me, but you get Hollywood stars in there and all of a sudden people are saying, wow, we can really have a film industry here. Absolutely. So. Well, now it's been seven years since then. How do you feel about the industry in New Mexico now? You know, I thought that all of this would be starting up in seven weeks are in seven months at the most because I'm, I'm that kind of, you know, rush ahead yeah. kind Over, of woman. But I think we're just at the beginning now. I don't think this is the film industry. I think this is the beginning of the film industry. I believe that New Mexico can be responsible for really beautiful, inspiring stories. I believe it can be the independent film capital of the world. I know we haven't gone in quite that direction, but look at what's happening now. Robert Redford is coming here and he's the independent king. Really? Where is he? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Today, right. yeah I, I, I'm ready for my close-up. <laughs> right. Well, I wanted to ask you about that because obviously the state has grown by leaps and bounds in the presence it has in the industry now, and we have a great crew base, much better than a lot of other cities around the world that are that are we're competing against. But I guess the thing um, that we talked about before, Hollywood is Hollywood because of the creative base that it has, the writers, producers, directors. What, where do you see that component uh, in New Mexico at right now? What, how, how would you rate that? Well, that, that is exactly what I'm talking about, that we have great talent here. We're acting as though we don't. We have great writers. You know, we have directors moving here. One of the, you know, Robert Redford is about as good as it gets with Academy Awards and whatnot. We have great stars living here. We have great producers here. So how important is it that we develop an indigenous film industry here? Um, I, it's one thing to have all these great productions coming in from out of state, but, but um, is that gonna continue if we don't have something in place here soon? Thanks for that question, Tony, because from the very first, I have been saying we have to build what can be the greatest independent film uh, industry in the country here in New Mexico. And when you say indigenous, most people think, oh, uh, Native American sure. or Hispanic, but we're all indigenous right. to this ground. And we can have a great industry here. I think they think when they're handing out uh, the money to make films and whatnot that they're handing it out to students. Mm -hmm. I've had 20 years of filmmaking and if I was going to either invite in Hollywood or build a great film industry here, I'd choose to build the great in film industry here because we're going to be here. We're not going anywhere. And we have great writers here. We have great actors here. We have great producers. We have great directors. We have everything we need. And I'm hoping, I've got my fingers crossed. Me too. <laughs> yep. I'm hoping that it really takes off now in that direction. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the actors. I, uh, of course, was one of the co-founders of the Duke City Shootout, and we employed a lot of 
a lot of local actors, but uh, many from out of state. And we sort of learned a funny lesson the first year. We had some people coming in from New York and LA and they had to bring their actor friends in. And we were so, oh, well, they're from LA, they're from New York, they must be really good. Well, as it turned out, the, the actors in the other movies from New Mexico turned out to be much better mm -hmm. than the people they brought in. And I think that's uh, one of the misnomers about the quality of acting talent this year. Could you talk to that a little bit? Well, I've just written a movie script and if anyone out there has any money that they'd like to invest in a, in a wonderful uh, film script. Um, and some actors read it and loved it. And they came to, to the Spirit Production Compound to read it. Mm -hmm. And about 50 people showed up to wow. hear it. And I was blown away. It was a cold reading. Wow. And I was blown away by the quality of the actors. I mean, it's ridiculous that we think we have to bring everything in. And I'm hoping to actually uh, direct that film awesome. uh, with uh, mostly local actors. You know, there's a feeling that if you don't put somebody that's very well known in a film, that no one's going to want to see it. But after Slumdog Millionaire, it's a little hard. That's a tough yeah, sell. Exactly. Absolutely. You know, so. You also write for Animal Planet? You, uh, I did, I did okay. when I was in Los Angeles. That was one of the first writing jobs. And I'll never forget the first time they gave me tapes. And I was so, I, I looked at them and I was appalled. And I thought, what am I going to do with all of this? It doesn't make any sense at all. And then the next morning, I woke up in my apartment in LA and I said, oh, where does the story come from? The story comes from the writer. And I got very excited and I did my first one and I got to do a whole year uh, of that series. And that series was Wild Rescue? Yes, yes. Wild Rescue. Wow, that's exciting. Yeah. You also write for the Santa Fe, Santa Fean magazine? I've written for the Santa Fean and the most recent thing that I've written has been uh, for the New Mexico magazine okay. because they asked me to do the five greatest films mm -hmm. you've never seen and uh, I got to do that article in the Tamale Wood edition uh -huh. last year which can you, was really fun. Can you, can you name remember them? those? <laughs> I can. One was Solace and it was an extraordinarily beautiful documentary that was done about 12 Santa Fe or no New Mexicans that were dying that were f uh, facing terminal illness. Mm -hmm. One was uh, uh, tell it to Uncle Graham, or do it for Uncle Graham. Uh, Candy Jones did a history of the Los Alamos uh, hazardous waste and all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, one was Peter Coyote's Outrageous Fortune, which was made in 1983 and has George Carlin in it as well. And I think it's one of the funniest movies ever made. So I don't know if everybody had seen that, but I wanted to throw it in because I love that movie. These movies all had to be made in New Mexico. One was Fool in Love. And I found out a lot. That was Bob Altman's very first feature film. And I found out a lot about the film and I watched it and I realized that I had seen it in the 1980s and hadn't really understood it mm. and was a little disappointed in it then and I urge everyone to see it again. And my very favorite was Off the Map and it was Joan oh. Allen and Sam Shepard. Mm. And I actually met Joan Allen at the film festival last year and she said it was one of her favorite films and someone had shown her the article and she was so gracious about it. She just said, oh, I'm so glad you love that movie. It's a virtual love letter to uh, New Mexico oh. and it's a wonderful, wonderful film. Sounds wonderful. Wanted to ask you about uh, the, the new project that you have upcoming later in this year. Uh, involving uh, a gathering of, of religious personages from around the world. Tell me a little bit about that. You know, there's a parliament of world religious leaders. I didn't even know about them. They've been uh, convening every five years since the late 1800s. Wow. You know, what could bring us any closer to world peace than for all the religions of the world to actually get together and like each other? So they're meeting this year in Melbourne, Australia. To my astonishment, they've picked Santa Fe, New Mexico as their sister city. They're going to make films of what they're doing and they asked me if I'd be the director. So I, I don't know 
enough about it to go any further than that, but I know that it's a beautiful thought and I'm really glad they picked me. Well, you've had just an incredible career and we're just really <laughs> lucky in New Mexico to have you here. Um, what's next for you? Well, I've got a very exciting feature film that I can't talk about yet that I almost have a signed option on and maybe you'll invite me back Absolutely. to uh, tell you about it. Which, by the way, in case you think that scripts are easy to write, it only took 16 years <laughs> <laughs> of writing and rewriting. But the name of it is Vivid Memories and it's an independent film that I hope to direct with uh, actors right here in New Mexico. So. Awesome. And I also have a documentary film. There's a man named Steve Moore and Virgin Farms right here in Albuquerque. And he grew five tons of very nutritious food on three acres of land in three months last year and gave it away. And we're trying to do a documentary on that because I think that that's the sort of thing that could really impact everyone regardless of whether you have a little pot or whether you have an acre of land or whether you're starving to death in Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, we need nutritionist food. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to turn that into a kind of television of, of food mm -hmm. uh, nutrition show too. So, you know, I have a whole bunch of uh, things like that I'm trying to do and not enough time to do them. Sounds like you've got a bunch up your sleeve. That's so great. Elizabeth, we're just so honored to have you on our show. Um, folks, we've been talking to Elizabeth Galen Baker, founder of Spirit Productions. I'm Sid Schulte. And I'm Tony Della Flora. We'll see you next time. Cinema Caliente.